Good morning, everyone. And a special good morning to all of you guys at home. We are so sorry that you couldn't be with us. This is an amazing church. I've had an incredible weekend, but you have been really missed, okay? So we really hope that you feel like you're part of what's happening here today. I'm going to give a quick recap, and I'm going to dive straight into it because of time, okay? We've been looking at one verse in Judges 8, verse 4. Gideon and his 300 men exhausted. Say exhausted. But you're not now, are you? After this weekend joke. Exhausted yet keeping up the pursuit, came to the Jordan and crossed it. And we've been looking at this idea that the Christian life, if you like, is this kind of pursuit for Jesus and for the things that Jesus wants in our life. And sometimes it's exhausting and sometimes things happen which stop us in that pursuit. And so we're looking at three big ideas that help us to keep the pursuit up even when we're exhausted, so that we run well, not just at the beginning of our race, but right the way through, right through to the very end. The idea, number one, was we're going to refuse to do life alone. There are certain people who enable us to be as we've never been before, and we looked at that in our first session. And then yesterday, we looked at this idea um, that, that, that actually we need to pursue what's worth pursuing that we can pursue the wrong things or we can go passive. And when we go passive, bad things always happen. But I want to look at this third idea, and it's going to kind of change tack a little bit for this now. And it's this idea of leaning into the power of partnership, leaning into the power of partnership. And when we look at the verse again, um, Gideon and his 300 men, exhausted yet keeping up the pursuit, came to the Jordan and crossed it. And... Um, I, I told you guys here in the room, um, those of you at home won't, won't know this, but I spoke to the guys in the room about a really tragic story that happened in our church community a couple of years ago, someone taking their own life, etc. And, and last November, I was in Israel with the parents and with the sister of this guy who took his own life. And amazingly and miraculously, through the tragedy of losing the brother and the son, um, the, the, the sister came to Jesus. She came back to Jesus. She'd been brought up a Christian, but, but had wandered away. And as a result of the trauma, uh, had, had come back to Jesus. And last November, me and my wife got to baptise her in the Jordan. And it was an amazing, amazing experience. And a week ago, or 10 days ago, she got married on the day of her brother's birthday. And just to show that there's some kind of redemption out of these difficult situations. But as me and my wife were in the River Jordan, if you've ever been there, it's not like you kind of imagine it to be. Do you know what I mean? So you imagine it to be all very Hollywood and all very kind of like, it was a muddy water. <laughs> and we were baptising lots of people and it's a proper river. And so you walk down some steps and then you step in and you're on a rock and there's me and my wife and, and there's all photographs and cameras. And as we baptised somebody, we fell off the rock and we both fell in and we're, we're drifting off down the current and our flip-flops are going up. And it wasn't very romantic or sentimental, but it was really powerful. And this little bit of water, the River Jordan, is so important in Scripture. The River Jordan often represents a barrier or a boundary or a marker between one level of life and another. And the reality is you and I, in our pursuit of Jesus, will come to many figurative River Jordans. And I want to speak to you individually, but I also want to speak to you as a church community and to all of you guys watching at home as well. Because I do sense as I've been praying and preparing that God is bringing or has brought you, many of you individually, but also corporately to a River Jordan moment where he wants you to cross over and to pass through. There's another level of life that God wants you to experience in your pursuit of him. And um, the, the word, the word in, in, in uh, Judges uh, chapter 8 verse 4, the word for cross over, a bar, literally means to pass over or to pass through. God doesn't want us to settle in our pursuit. He wants us to keep passing over and to keep passing through, to keep crossing these river Jordans. And I want to give you a few transitions that I think God wants to share with some of you, maybe individually, maybe corporately as well. The first transition is this, from dependence to interdependence. You see, if you think back about the children of Israel in the wilderness, when, when, um, when, when Joshua brought them into the promised land uh, through the River Jordan again, so that was before Judges, just to get that kind of right sequence. Um, in the wilderness, God did all the miracles. In the promised land, it's going to be both. It's going to be interdependence. 
in the promised land, literally they went, feed me and God fed me. But in the promise, in the wilderness, in the promised land, they've got to toil, they've got to sow, they've got to break up the ground and God still did the miraculous. You see a miracle, I've written this down, I found this somewhere. Miracle through the biblical tradition is not what we don't understand, but what is done for us that we can't do ourselves. The word does not mean that which is beyond our comprehension, but rather that which is beyond our ability. And you and I individually and corporately have to learn this interdependence, this partnership between what we do and what God does. And always Christians want to break those two things. To We don't need to do any preparation. We just leave it all up to God. Any of those kind of people in the room? Bob Marley kind of people, just relax and be happy. And then there's those kind of, we think, some of us like that, super uptight people who are so planned and so strategic. No, what about the Holy Spirit? It's not either or, it's both and. It's both and. Uh, Just a few uh, months ago, we had an amazing story where um, one of our guys, actually Andy, who's speaking at our place today, he had this um, email drop in in his box. And basically the story was this, this woman in her 30s in our community, in our town, who wasn't a church person at all. And um, she works away a lot and she's in Germany in a hotel. And for some unknown reason, we now know what the reason is, she feels to herself, I I wanna read the Bible. So she downloads the Bible on her phone and starts reading the Bible, then realizes I need some help. So she goes on Google to search for churches in her town and we come up at the top. So she watches some services online and then on our website, there's a kind of a, hey, we'd love to chat to you kind of thing. And she fills it in and it lands in Andy's box. And long story short, she's now a Christian. And she met up with Andy a couple of weeks ago to talk about getting baptised. And it's amazing because she's watched us online weeks and weeks and weeks before she ever walked into the building. She says, I, if I'm, because she works away a lot. She says, whenever I'm out of the country, I'm always watching online. And then when I can, I come. And she says, and do you know what? I used to read tarot cards and I used to be into all that stuff. But like Jesus has stopped the desire for all of that. And I can't explain it, but Jesus is changing my life. And we tell those stories every week we come together and there's loads of them because I want people to know, hey, you who did the website, that was part of what, you, what was happening there. You who do online, that's part of what is happening there. All of this stuff is what we can do, but none of us could give her a desire in Germany to want to read the Bible, right? That's only a work of the Holy Spirit. A miracle in the new land is interdependence. It's what we do and what God does. And we recognise that we can't do what God can do, but we're going to do what we can do, okay? And I think a church needs to move from dependence to interdependence. Secondly, from passive to active. I didn't mention it yesterday, okay? But I was going to because my team, Villa, were 1-0 up on Tim's team, Liverpool, until right at the end of the game and the blighters scored an equaliser. But I'm over it. I'm over it. But you know, great footballers don't go to where the ball has been. They anticipate to where it's going to go. They go from passive to active. And I think that's an important transition. And I don't know how passive or active your prayers are, individually and corporately. I I, I love kids' prayers, don't you? Listen to some of these. God, I want to be just like my daddy when I grow up, but not so hairy. I love that. And then this, God, please take care of my family and take care of yourself. If anything happens to you, we're going to be in a big mess. I mean, it's true, isn't it? It's profound. But let me ask you a question. If the prayers you're praying now are all answered, whose life is going to be changed apart from your own? You see, many of us get into passive prayers where we just pray for me and mine. But I want to encourage you and invite you into a pursuit of a more active prayer life when, yes, we pray for ourselves and we pray for our family. I pray for my family every single day. I shared some of the stuff uh, in my family yesterday. But I don't want to just pray for my family. I want to pray for my community who desperately need Jesus. I want to pray for my nation that's in a complete mess right now. I want to pray for our world that's never been so divided and so fractured as it is right now. And if all my prayers were answered, whose lives would be changed other than me and my own. So from passive to active. And um, we uh, just a few years ago, we were celebrating, I think it was 30 years uh, as a church. And um, one, one of our guys uh, uh, found on Twitter a tweet. And the, t- and the tweet said, Hail Owen, the place where dreams go to die. Yeah. 
And uh, we, we sat around a table and we said, no, 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 no. We're not having that. We are not having that. And, and after we got over the little kind of bit of hurt, do you know what I mean? Because it's our town and we love it. We said, we're going to go on the front foot here. So when we did this um, community event, we had thousands of people uh, in the community at this massive event with loads of you know, bouncy castles and all that kind of stuff. And then at the end of it, we, we invited everybody, Christians and non-Christians, and we told them about this tweet and we said, we don't believe that, do we? So we got a whole load of balloons, eco-friendly, uh, and, uh, and we got these little kind of dream cards. And we said, what's your dream for this town? And we got thousands of people who wrote their dream for this town. Many of them weren't Christians and we let them go. And since that moment, God has done some amazing things. We look back at that moment as a marker moment. Before that, since that, we've gone multi-site. We've changed our name. We've got a church in Albania. We've seen more people baptised than we ever have in our history. And it's almost like since that moment when we said, how Owen, the place where dreams go to die, not on my watch not on our watch. And we move from passive to active. And I want to encourage you, Riverside, I do sense that God's saying something to you. I'll get to that in a minute about that shift. And COVID has caused us to become so passive and so reactive. We need to get out of that passive and reactive mode. The third transition is from aimless to purposeful. From aimless to purposeful. Do you know, people are 40% more likely 40% more likely to help someone in need if they've just walked past a cemetery. Scary, the the work that some people do to work that out, isn't it? But apparently if you've just walked past a cemetery, you're heightened to the reality of life and the mortality of life and you're more likely to want to help someone else in need because there's something clarifying about our mortality. Lance Witt, who's a great author that I like a lot, he said, God's primary interest is not your comfort, it's your character. It's not your happiness, it's your holiness. It's not your prosperity, it's his purposes. But you know, if we're going to move, if we're going to keep that pursuit up, if we're going to cross those Jordans, if we're going to lean into the power of partnership, we have got to know our why. We've got to know our why. And some of you will know that language if you're in the kind of leadership space, Simon Sinek, that whole know your why. And I want to show you a little video. It's one of my favourite videos of all. I play it a lot. And it's a guy called Michael Jr. who's an uh, American Christian comedian in the States. And part of what he does in his shows, in his comedy shows, is he sometimes breaks in and has a bit of fun with someone in the audience. And what I want to show you, I want you to watch not just what happens to the guy, but the impact on the people around the guy when he knows his why. Take a look at this. How do I know? A lot of people, when they think of the phrase, how do I know, they always want to put the what behind it. How do I know what I'm supposed to do? The the question that you really should ask is, how do I know why I'm here? Because when you know your why, your what becomes more clear and more impactful. If you know, like for instance, um, people know that I do comedy, but that's what I do. My why is to inspire people to walk in purpose. So I can do comedy, I can write books, I can be in a movie, because all of it is motivated by my why. In fact, I have a new, uh, a new web series out called Michael Jr. Break Time. Uh, we probably just did the sixth episode. It's on YouTube. So every single Wednesday at three o'clock, we drop a new episode on YouTube of Michael Jr. break time. What it is, is it's me, I travel around the country and I do stand-up comedy, in case you didn't know. (laughs) And in the middle of my comedy set sometime, I'll stop and just talk to my audience. And we've been filming this and it's, you know, it's it's pretty cool. So (laughs) we're in Winston-Salem. I'm gonna show you a clip from Winston-Salem. And I'm just talking to this guy in the audience and he tells me that he's a, uh, a musical instructor at a school. So I was like, all right, you're a musical instructor. You know, can you sing? Let me hear you sing a song. So this is what happened at the last episode of Michael Jr.'s Break Time. Check it. So you're a musical director. Cool. Yes, sir. All right, so um, let, me get a couple, let me get a couple bars of like uh, Amazing Grace. Can you do the first part of that? Let me, go ahead. Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Wow. That brought could sing. You know what I'm saying? All right, all right. Um, 
Now, once you give me the version, is if uh, your uncle just got out of jail, you got shot in the back when you was a kid. I'm just saying, let me see the hood version real quick. If you know which version I'm talking about, just see if that exists. Let me see what you got. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Was blind, but now I, I see. Okay, um, here's what I want you to catch. The first time I asked him to sing, he knew what he was doing. The second time, he knew why he was doing it. When you know your why, your what becomes more impactful because you're walking towards or in your purpose. So what are you doing? More importantly, why? What's your why as a church? Our why as a church is to help people find and follow Jesus. And we launched a church in a village a few years ago and there were two other churches in the, in the village. And before we ever spoke to our church, I went to speak to the leaders, tried to build relationship and the one welcomed us in, the other not so much. Um, but after the one welcomed us in, we'd been going for a few months and then I had an email saying, could you come and see me? And so I went down and as I walked into the church, not only was I seeing the leader, but I was seeing the whole leadership team. So I thought, okay, this isn't going to go well. And basically they said, we're really annoyed. And I said, why are you annoyed? They said, well, well, we welcome you in. I said, yeah. And he said, and you're giving leaflets out into, into the street and you're, you're trying to reach people. And I said, yeah. And then he said this, and I didn't know whether to laugh or cry. When you said you were coming into our village, we thought you were just coming here with your people to worship. We didn't think you were coming to reach anybody. And I felt really sad. And we've got a great relationship with them now. But I walked away thinking, it's so easy for a church to lose its why, isn't it? And we become all about us and we become all about our nice experiences. And actually there's a whole world around us which is dying to a lost eternity and they need Jesus. And, and as I was preparing this, I, I sensed that God might want to say something to you as a church. And um, I don't know whether this is prophetic or not, that's for you to test and weigh it. But I felt that God was saying that there is a new day for you to seize if you're willing to seize it. There is a new day for you to step into if you're willing to step into it. And there's that verse that we know in Isaiah and it's an overused verse that see I'm doing a new thing, you know, but, but, but there's that verse that's connected to that. Forget the former things, do not dwell on the past. And we know that it doesn't really mean don't think about the past because the verse before that talks about the past and it reminds them of what God did in the past. But the key word is dwell because the word dwell means inhabit or reside. In other words, we go back to the past, but we don't dwell and reside there. We walk back a bit in order to walk forward a lot. So we revisit our past, but not to live there, but in order to go forward into the future. And I felt Riverside that there's a new day for you as a church come in if you want to possess it. Anyone excited about that? I'm excited for you, but it's up to you. And I wrote a few things down and, and I just, I'll just read it out and then I'll pray for you. And then I'll just say one more thing before we finish. A new day will require some new thinking. You cannot solve tomorrow's battles with yesterday's thinking. A new day will require some new weapons. You cannot fight tomorrow's battles with just yesterday's weapons. A new day will require some new courage. You cannot win today's battles with yesterday's courage. And a new day will require some new commitment. You cannot possess the new day with the commitment from the old day. 
And I've been really inspired by just learning a little bit about the history of this church. And we honour the past, but we don't honour it by living in it. We honour it by learning from it, by embracing it, and by step moment when you need to. That looks like that's for you to figure out. But I do to cross into the new, or are we going to stay here? But if you stay where you are and settle, it won't go well. But if you step forward and embrace what God has for you, I believe your best days are ahead of you. Amen. Let me pray for a moment. And I'm not finished, but I want to just pray. Father, I pray for this incredible church. Pray for all these amazing people here on the weekend and those that are at home as well. And I pray, Jesus, that you brought them so far in this last 35 or whatever it is years and you've done such a lot in the kingdom in them and through them but God you have not finished with them and you have so much ahead of them and I pray for the leaders and for every single person in the church that they would embrace the new day that you have for them in Jesus name. Amen. So how do we do that? How do we how do we how do we step across our Jordans individually and corporately? And I want to just finish with a few kind of pictures because I think these are important. And I'm going to picture the first one of Moses and the Red Sea. And there's an incredible couple of verses from Isaiah where it says this: Then his people recalled the days of old, the days of Moses and his people. Where is he who brought them through the sea with the shepherd of his flock? Where is he who set his Holy Spirit among them? Listen, who sent his glorious arm of power to be at Moses' right? Hand. Ada, would you just come up for a minute? I think you're the most Moses looking character that I can see on the front row. It's going to be Tim, but no. Just step up here. So here's Moses. Okay, just imagine bigger beard. Okay, longer beard. Um, here's Moses, and he's at the Red Sea, and he's got two million uh, Israelites looking to him. Okay, they're looking to you, mate. All right. He's got the sea in front of him. He's got desert either side, and he's got the Egyptian army pursuing him. And he's like, God, what do I do? And what does God say? Reach out your, what? What does he say? Reach out your hand with a staff. So reach out your right hand for me. Okay, with a staff. Okay. And, and, and he's got the staff and he's reaching it out. And imagine how he felt as a leader, two million people looking to him and they're looking to him what he's going to do. And they look at him, they think, the guy's gone crazy. He's fishing. It looks like he's fishing, but he's reaching out his arm. He doesn't feel, there's no Nord keyboard. There's no Holy Spirit pads in the background. Do you know what I mean? There's nothing of that going on. He's just literally reaching out the staff. And in that moment, the Bible says there in Isaiah that God sent his glorious arm of power. So if you imagine me as God, okay, imagine him as Moses. He sent his glorious arm. Now, which arm opened up the sea, God's or Moses's? Thank you. That's the right answer, Glory. That's the right answer. It's both. Now, we know that the power was all God's, but it, that partnership, and I want you to see this as a picture because this is so important. And I've, I saw this years ago, and it helps me so many times. Often I reach out my hand, and I don't feel anointed or spiritual. Anyone like me? And I don't, like I'm sharing with my neighbour, and I don't feel it. There's no keyboard in the background. There's nothing. I'm reaching my arm out, but the promise is that as I reach my arm out, so God reaches his glorious arm of power, and together we see amazing things happen. Thank you, Moses. But here's the thing. Track it back to Exodus chapter 3. When, when that bush was burning and, and God said, come across and, uh, and, and he heard that, that, that sound and the bush wasn't, didn't consume it. And, Jesus, and God said, what's that in your hand? And he said, it's a staff. And he said, throw it to the ground. And he threw it to the ground and it became a snake. And then he said, take the snake by the tail. You never take a snake by the tail because the venom's in the head. And he took it by the tail and it became a snake again. And it's not a staff again. And it's like, what's all this about? Well, you see, the staff is a symbol of his identity and his security and who he was as a shepherd. And it's almost like God say, hey, what you got in your hand has the potential to become a snake and turn and bite you. And that can be your reputation as a church. It can be your identity as an individual. But what you have in your hand, if you hold it in your hand all the time, you hold onto it so tight, it can become a snake and it can turn and bite you. But if you surrender it to me, I'll deal with the venom part and then I'll bring it back to you. And the amazing thing was, before then, it was known as the staff of Moses. After that, it was always known as the staff of God. And that's the staff. That he, hung, that he stuck out. And that's the staff that he struck the rock and water came out of it. And it's this beautiful picture of partnership. One more, Gideon, and then we're going to pray. And um, in Gideon chapter 6, verse 34, so before the verse that we've been looking at, there's a great verse. Then the Spirit of the Lord clothed Gideon with power. 
He blew a ram's horn as a call to arms and the men of the clan of Abiza came to him. Tim, I'll use you this time, okay? You can be Gideon, he was Moses. And so here's this picture of Gideon clothed with power. One trans, just come and stand here for me, Gideon. You're the weakest in the, in the least important tribe of Israel. <laughs> just trying to, it's just an illustration, my friend. And, and so basically, the, the thing says that Gideon was clothed with power. So I always think to myself, okay, if, if that's clothed with power, that's a strange analogy. So it's almost like, like this is God and Gideon puts God on and he's clothed with power. Until I understood that that's not what it means at all. You see, th- th- this is not Gideon and this is God. It's completely the other way around. In other words, this is God and he's looking for a Gideon. He's looking for someone who's saying, I want to be your suit of clothes. Isn't that amazing? In other words, God's saying, I want to clothe myself with you. In other words, are you available? You're not putting me on. It's like, I know this is a metaphor. I'm putting you on. And so in other words, you're going to cross your Jordan when you become available and open to me. Because what I am doing is I am looking for a suit of clothes like you that I can fill and inhabit and I can touch a broken, hurting world through you. Thank you, Gideon. Isn't that beautiful? Howard Hendricks says it this way. Lord, and this is a prayer that he prays. Lord, here I am. I want to be your suit of clothes today. I want you to take me and use me. Lord, walk around in me today. In Acts chapter 1, verse 8, and Jesus says, and you'll receive my power to be my witnesses. And that word power, dunamis, we think of dynamite, but really it means dynamic. It means the ability to get the job done. Could Birmingham be saved? So Jesus is looking, the Holy Spirit is looking for available suits of clothes that are saying every day of their life, when they go into the NHS, when they go into college, when they go into the community, when they go into the marketplace, when they go into wherever they go, when they talk to their neighbours, I'm available to you. Will you fill me? Will you fill me? And will you move in me and through me in partnership? Isn't that amazing? And I want to pray for you in a moment, but there's one more transition and we are going to end with this. I'm watching the time. And it's from orphan to son and daughter. And just for a moment, let's go back to the River Jordan where Jesus gets baptised with that moment, that beautiful moment. And at that time, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee, was baptised by John in the Jordan. Just as Jesus was coming up out of the water, he saw heaven being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, you are my son whom I love. With you, I'm well pleased. We won't just cross the Jordan by, but by a recognition of who we are. That we're not, it's not just about how much faith we have. It's about the recognition that we have a good father, right? And that we have a good father. We move from orphan to son and daughter. And we say, God, because of what you've done in me and through me, I'm going to cross over this Jordan into the land that you have for me. I want to just invite the band to come back up. And I want to just pray for you as I close. And then we're going to take communion together. And it may be today that, as you've been here this weekend, or maybe you're at home and you just rec- you know, resonate with what I'm saying, that maybe you feel like, hey, I am at a Jordan moment in my life right now. I'm at this barrier and I can't seem to cross it. And maybe God is saying to you, but you aren't activating anything. You're too passive. If you activate, if you make yourself available, stretch your arm out, I'll stretch my arm out. Make yourself available. I'll fill you and I'll move in you and through you. And I will clothe myself with you with power. But we've got to do something. Whenever we activate, God moves. You know, the other one that we didn't look at was when Joshua and the priest brought the Ark of the Covenant through the Jordan. Interestingly enough, with Moses, when he reached the the staff out, the sea parted, this priest had to put their foot in the water, get their feet wet before the water opened. It's all the same. It's partnership. We activate and God responds. God activates and we respond. It's the partnership together. So I want to just pray for you. Let me just close our eyes for a moment. And if there's somebody and you're like, It's been so long since I felt filled by the Holy Spirit. And you're saying, Jesus, here I am. Would you fill me? Would you fill me again? I'm not an orphan. I'm a son and I'm a daughter. I know who I am. God, would you fill me by your Spirit again? I'd love to pray for you. And if that's you, I'd just love you to stand and maybe at home as well. Maybe you just respond and maybe just right where you are, just put your hands out and I'd love to pray for you. So if that's you this morning, I'd love you to stand and we're going to pray for you that you would just be filled again by the Spirit of Jesus. On this day, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, God. 
Thank you, Lord Jesus. Yeah, Lord, we're standing because we're saying we're available. We want to be your suit of clothes. We want you to fill us and inhabit us. And Jesus, by your Spirit, would you fill us right now again? Would you breathe life and power into us, I pray. Some of us that have paused, some of us that are settled, some of us that have been hurt and just in that pursuit of you. Some of us that have come to the Jordan and we just can't see for the life of us, see how we can cross over it. Well, we can't on our own, but with you, all things are possible. And so Lord, right now, we reach out our hands. Let's reach out our hands and we say, God, would you fill us? Would you fill us by your Spirit again? In a moment, we're gonna take communion. We're gonna remind ourselves of what you've done for us, but you've, you've done all of this so that by your Spirit, you could fill us with your life. This is not a religious activity. This is a, this is a moment where we remember what you've done and we remember what you're wanting to do in us and through us. And so Lord, I pray for every single one of us that are responding to you right now, those that are responding at home as well, that you would fill them by your Spirit, that we would not give up the pursuit, but we would keep up the pursuit. And when we come to the Jordans, we will not settle, but we will cross by the power of your Spirit. And so Lord, for this amazing church, God, would you fill this church again with courage, not just for yesterday, but for today and for tomorrow. With power, not just for yesterday, but for today and for tomorrow. And so Lord, we will keep up the pursuit because You are worth it. You are our why. And Lord Jesus, we know that this is not just for us, but this is for the hundreds and thousands of others who are yet to experience who You are. But Lord, maybe with a few people surrendered and available like we are, then maybe you could just do more than we could ask or imagine. So Jesus, we receive your Spirit again today by faith in Jesus' Name. Amen.